Okay, welcome everyone. Today, this morning, we are hearing from Ken Brandt, the co-chair of the Education Committee for the International Planetarium Society and a NASA Solar System Ambassador. He will be and an astronomy lecturer at USCB. He will be speaking on landing site selection. So welcome, and you have Thank the floor, you. sir. All right. Uh, can everybody hear me and see my screen okay? I uh, can't see your... I can, I, can't see. I, can hear, I can hear and see you. Okay, perfect. All right. Students, Next. give me a thumbs up if you also hear and see. Yeah. Okay, so I'm here to talk about landing on Mars. Because obviously, if your mission is going to be successful, you have to successfully land and deploy your all your stuff on Mars, right? Safely. You know, that means probably multiple trips, depending on how mass, mass, mass able your rocket is, uh, how much mass it can carry per payload. Um, you may have to seed things ahead of time, um, you know, drop off pieces of habitats and things like that long before the astronauts actually arrive. Okay. So we're talk I'm going to start you off with talking about uh, the parameters NASA uses or used to land robots on Mars. Okay. Now, in all in all three of the first rover lander, uh, lander rather, landers and a rover, um, the first three Martian landing missions from the U.S., um, Pathfinder, Sojourner, and the Vikings one and two, um, they looked for flat areas. It was basically the best they could do with the imaging capabilities they had at the time. Um, the Vikings, for example, actually went into orbit for several months, snapping images of potential landing sites from up close and then picking a landing site. So that was kind of intuitive to actually use the orbiter to get up closer to Mars and get resolution down to, I think it was about two meters or something like that uh, for their cameras. So a pretty dependable landing site. Of course, both Vikings, as you know, were wildly successful. Um, they did everything we asked them to do. And people are still looking at one of those experiments and saying, you know, to me, it looks like circadian rhythm going on here, but that's just me. Um, okay, so that was 20 years after, or 10 years after um, uh, Pathfinder and Sojourner land on Mars, six years, excuse me. Um, NASA launches two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. I forgot to close the parent there. Um, their job is to follow the water. They were looking for direct, measurable evidence of the presence of liquid water in the past on Mars. And both rovers found it. Spirit had to do a little driving to get there, um, which is a theme we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, you land somewhere flat and then drive to the good stuff. Okay, we're actually looking at, I believe, um, a panorama that Spirit took on Mars of looking up to the Columbia Hills, which is where we end up finding the evidence for the water it was looking for. Opportunity landed inside of a crater with a sedimentary rock outcrop. It was like, here you go. Here's evidence of water right in front of you. <laughs> Very easy. You know, so NASA did an excellent job of selecting the Meridiani Planum uh, with its deposits of hematite as a landing site. Now remember hematite because that's a mineral um, that in some forms could be very valuable on Earth. Okay, um, looking for evidence of organics. I forgot to put, well, what, you know, you tell me, what rover would, would be the rover that looked for evidence of organic chemicals on Mars first? Which one did that? So this is me asking you a question, please answer. They, they have heard a lot about that this week. So I hope oh, everyone who's here, um, was was on that call. All right, anybody typing in in chat or you know, just typing in the chat if you know what it is because I can pull up the chat here. Okay. All right, good. All right. No, huh? All right. Well, it starts with the seed. Does that help? <laughs> All right. How about Curiosity? Yeah. Right. So the Curiosity rover uh, was sent to look for organic chemicals on Mars. It's found them in groves, in addition to ample evidence of flowing and standing liquid water on the planet in the past. So Mars, you know, the whole reason for exploring Mars, I guess we should kind of start with that, you know, and the whole concept of why we explore. And basically, we explore because we're curious. You know, you can gussy it up all you want with the scientific 
gizmos and engineering, you know, leaps. And bottom line is we're curious. We want to know what's under the rock. We want to know what's behind the, the bend, behind that mountain ridge in front of us. As human beings, that is our, the way we are. Um, to evaluate for potential past and current life and habitability, um, perseverance. Uh, perseverance is actually a multitasking mission because not only did it carry a helicopter, um, which is able to do reconnaissance ahead of the rover now. So the, the, the helicopter will fly ahead of the projected path of the rover and NASA will then choose a path based on what the, the airborne assessment of the uh, terrain looks like. So that's pretty cool. That's a new thing. Um, sample return is very important because you can only put so many instruments on your colony or only so many instruments on a rover the size of a mid-size uh, SUV. You can't put everything on there you want to. You know, scanning electron microscope would be great. Right now, the size is prohibitive. You can't stick that on a, on a rover and send it to Mars yet. But um, so sample return, a method for you to gather samples, and send them back to Earth might not be a bad thing to have. You know what I'm saying? Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, say no more. Uh, the um, landing safely, in general, all of these rovers uh, landed in a fairly flat space, and then they drove to the good bits. Example, Spirit driving up into the Columbia Hills to find the evidence for hot springs, for example. All right, so we're going to move to the next slide. Maybe. There we go. All right, so this is where the robots had landed or attempted landing on Mars so far. Okay. Uh, anything in green you see is a successful mission. Anything in red or yellow, not so much. Okay, so um, so you can see the successful landers, and they seem just to, to spread out across the equator. Um, for Pathfinder and Spirit and Opportunity, that's a really good idea because they're solar powered. So the max of um, solar insulation, insolation, in I-N-S-O-L, uh, as opposed to insulation like what you wrap wires in, um, insolation simply means the amount of sunlight that an area gets per square meter. Okay, and it changes depending on winter and summer. But if you're at the equator, winter and summer, the sun doesn't get very much different in the sky. We'll get about 20, 20 30. On Mars, 23 and a half degrees higher or lower. So even on even on the dead of winter, um, you can park your rover like Spirit on the side of a hill facing the sun, and it would charge up batteries just fine. Um, so this is where the landing sites on Mars are so far. As you decide where you're going to put your mission on Mars, uh, there's several things you might want to consider. There. Now, the reason why Perseverance got to land in such a close proximity to its delta that it was exploring has to do with terrain relative navigation. You're seeing a radar map here of the surface of the floor of Jezero Crater. Now, red is bad. Hills, jagged rocks, sand, any one of a number of hazards you don't want curiosity or excuse me, Perseverance plopping down into, all right? Blue is good. Blue is flat rock or very, very, uh, sandy, but not duty. So you can still drive on the sand. Um, blue is good. Red is bad. It's easy way to remember this map. Um, and you can see uh, Perseverance snuggled in right in between those two red uh, splotches there in the middle. That little green dot is where Perseverance and Ingenuity landed on Mars back in February 21. And um, you can see they did a good job of landing basically in an area the size of a doctor's office parking lot. Okay, not very big. Maybe rows, three or four rows of cars, and that's it. So they landed this thing literally on a dime. Very nice. All right, so what about us? What about humans? What constraints should you consider as you are planning your mission to Mars? Uh, one of the most important things to consider is the availability of Martian resources you can use on site. In situ resource utilization. You've heard it before, but you're hearing it now from this, this um, from my take on it. In terms of choosing a landing site, you want to land somewhere close to the goodies, maybe uh, underground glacier or a place where Europe, Europe's Ex Express um, rover has found bodies of liquid water under the surface of Mars. 
So you may want to camp out on top of one of those. You know, just pop a well, drill it, tap a well. Um, you surface and subsurface water ice are the most obvious because there's abundant water ice both on the surface and subsurface of Mars, if you know where to look. And I specify water ice because it's also carbon dioxide ice, which does you no good, essentially, unless you're trying to concentrate it and use it to bake it off to warm the planet. I don't know. That's that's next level stuff. I don't think you have to worry about in this particular instance. Uh, one of the things you want to use is an oxygen generator on a bigger scale than the MOXIE uh, machine on the Perseverance rover. The MOXIE machine is capable, I forgot the, uh, I think it was about a pound of oxygen per two hours out of the carbon dioxide atmosphere of Mars. So you can make your own oxygen and the air you breathe. And in that sense, it doesn't really matter too much where you land because carbon dioxide will be everywhere. Um, so that, but in the foreground of this background image I've got here, you see a whole bunch of loose stones, okay, cobbles. And cobbles are very handy when you're trying to say, put boundaries on the edge of your road, if you're gonna build a road on Mars or use them for building material to then pave over uh, with other materials, fine. Um, marketable minerals like opal, um, opal is a precious gemstone. It's October's birthstone. And the Curiosity uh, rover team recently announced that they found veins of opal on Mars in Gale Crater. And so that might be a place to land and actually mine the stuff and bring it back to Earth. Can you imagine how much a carat, C A R A T carat, of opal? would fetch, a uh, gem-grade opal would fetch on Earth if you said it was from the planet Mars? Nice, right? <laughs> You'd be rich. It might even pay for your colony, who knows? Um, friendly geology, Let's talk about what that means. Okay, now I wanted to, I, I should have put the slide one slide earlier. This is all the places on Mars where there's evidence of glacier-related geomorphism. So basically glaciers help to carve out the landscape or they left remains of themselves, or as you can see in the inset um, in the lower left, they might still be there covered up by sand and dust because the sand and dust would act as an effective insulator from the sun. This time, I, this time I'm saying INSUL, insulator. So there's abundant locations where there are glaciers on Mars and have been glaciers on Mars. The, the key is, do you find a glacier that's still has ice in it, water ice in it. That's, that's a key, okay? Uh, surface irradiation is a problem. We're looking at a map on the right here of global magnetism on Mars. Some areas, especially in the Southern Hemisphere of Mars, the red basically um, is high concentration, uh, high concentration of magnetic fields. So that might not be a bad place to land. Um, and the question you have to ask yourself, is it worth a trade-off of scientific value to land someplace where so you know it's safe and you know you're not going to get uh, you're not going to get so you go in the dark? And other things you should consider, including include grandeur. And I'm going to play a clip here of Dave's the actor portraying Dave Scott talking about exactly that. From this is from a series called uh, From the Earth to the Moon. HBO did about a dozen years ago. And the episode is called Galileo is Right. Are you seeing the video okay? Yes. Good, thank you. We aren't hearing a lot of it. Maybe rewind it and start it over because it's kind of cutting out and slow. Okay. Um, is there a setting I can use on my machine to optimize for video? I know Google Meet has something such, but- um... Um, I do not know on a Windows machine. Okay. All right, so we'll drop back to here. So, Marius Hills and Hadley Rural, two potential landing sites for Apollo 16 
And this is the room. This is kind of what you'll be doing, making a decision. Where am I going to land on Mars? You know, um, and having that discussion. That is, this is what this discussion looks like at NASA 50 years ago. Yeah, it, it keeps cutting out. We can't hear it. Um, is your volume on YouTube all the way up? It is. That's why I put the, uh, the, the, the subtitles in. Okay. Okay. Sorry to interrupt again. No, it's okay. That's really what, the, that's the gist of what I want you all to get. Um, if you got ugly places and pretty places to go to, pick the pretty ones. Because, you know, all right, let's see, slideshow. All right, we're going to have to, there. Okay. Um, so radiation mitigation. Okay, somebody else, I, I know at least one of their uh, professors talked about this, but um, you want to be close to lava caves are not a bad thing. Um, ridges, valleys, anything that shields your habitat at all from the sun is going to be a good thing. Because the sun is the bulk of the radiation problems on Mars. Um, There's just a lot of solar wind and Mars atmosphere, as you know, as Tony Rice told you yesterday, is very thin and it's too too thin to um, to filter out UV like uh, our atmosphere does here on Earth. It's also it's nice to have an ozone layer, which Earth has, and of course Mars does not. So radiation is an important consideration, especially if you're going to be there a while. Um, obviously, you can use the rubble and everything to bury your habitat under rock and minerals, or you can just uh, use a preformed hole that Mars has already made for you and block off both ends of it, and you now have an air airtight habitat that you can now live in. Of course, you're underground, so there's that hassle. Okay, and we talked about Granger. Uh, some resources you might want to consider. This is actually my last slide. Uh, resources you might want to consider in using to determine your landing site. Um, Arizona's high rise instrument aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is able to take pictures where they could read your license plate if you're driving on Mars. Okay, that's how good, basically they took a CIA spy grade camera uh, that is orbiting the earth right now, taking pictures of people's license plates and, um, and doing this, to, and then able to see features on Mars that are rather small. So obviously you can get down to, um, you know, cobble size rocks and figure out, does your habitat support landing in an area that's close to or on a geologic, um, what I call geologically friendly environment. And of course, um, Gail Crater here, and the inset picture on the right is um, the opal that Curiosity is found on Mars. It occurs in veins, just like some of the opal here on Earth does, um, in Australia, for example. So where is the opal on Mars? It's a good question. Um, it is going to be pretty abundant, it seems like, because the processes that form opal uh, are working, uh, have worked on Mars as well as Earth. And that's an important thing to consider. When you consider Mars geology and things like that, uh, there's a word that, um, that I love to throw around called uniformitarianism. And uniformitarianism basically states that if it's true here, it's true any place where there are rocks. Okay. Uh, volcanic rocks form the same way on Earth and Mars. Sedimentary rocks form the same way on Earth and Mars. You can see in this, in this column of opal on the right, it is surrounded by cake, a layer cake of sedimentary rocks. Um, that remind one of the pages of a book. And that's exactly what they, what they are. It's a Martian geology textbook right in front of you there. And you can actually strip down layer by layer how much water, how much salt 
was in the water, for example. And in the case of opportunity, opportunity found a salt profile that was increasing as you came up closer to the top of the outcrop, which means that the outcrop is in a place where the water was evaporating and leaving salt behind, kind of like the Great Salt Lake in Utah, in the US. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over here to questions. If you have any questions about anything I've got, um, either put them in the chat or go ahead and um, go ahead and ask them out loud, whichever you prefer. So I'm standing by. Okay, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, there are students still entering the room, um, but I, what do you think is the best place if you were going to land on Mars? Uh -huh. What are the main three parameters that you would look for, and what where would you land? All right, let's look at the global map of Mars here. Um, assuming we're going to make some assumptions here. We're assuming that my habitat and the spaceship I'm on has the terrain relative navigation feature, which I understand is optional, <laughs> kind of like buying a new car, you know, optional features. Um, you want terrain relative navigation because that, that will help you find a pinpoint landing site, which means you can land in more dangerous areas. Me, I would want to land near the pole. Like I would, I would honestly, Phoenix's landing site didn't look that bad. You know, it would be a nice place to set a rocket down. Um, and then get my long range rover drive to the really geologically interesting places nearby. So I'm, I'm voting for landing someplace nice and safe, flat and driving to where you need to go to get your science done. Um, but again, the grandeur piece is important. I'm not sure how far that would weigh into my decision, but I'd certainly like to look at scenery out the window, especially if I'm gonna be on a, in a place for two years, well, it needs to have nice scenery. You know, um, it's gotta have water. Either I land directly on the ice or I land right near it, where I can just take the cooler out there in my spacesuit, fill it up with ice, bring it back in, melt it down, purify it, and drink it, or use it to run the ship, you know, with fuel cells, actually provide electrical power. So if you've got abundant water, and I can really do stuff. And you know, ice is, itself is not a bad insulator. Um, there's several ways to harden your habitat protection against radiation but yeah i would definitely land somewhere uh relatively safe for me but that's my personal druthers you know you you obviously may want to land somewhere else if you want to land for um like uh, right next to the rim of the Valles marineris or in the on, in the caldera of um, olympus mons it's really a lot of good places to land on mars um but of all the ones, I kind of like uh, Eberswald Crater, which uh, NASA hasn't selected it for a landing site. It's been in the last two rotations for Curiosity and Perseverance, but they didn't pick it. But it's got a delta within a delta. So there's actually two river lake systems that are featured in Eberswald that, um, that would be so fascinating to discover um, or to explore. But the bottom line is anywhere you go on Mars, grandeur or no, flat or not, whatever, you're going to find stuff people have not found before. And that's important. That's all about what that's, that's exploration at its finest. Um, Next question. Do you think it's possible to land near a cave system? Are there any safe cave systems that you could put a dome over the top of? What would the pressure be like inside a cave? And could it be pressurized if needed. All right, well, I'm going to start the answer here by saying I, volcanic lava tubes are not my, my specialty. So um, I'm pretty sure that a lava tube goes from point A to point B, which means there are two entrances or two exits. And that, that would mean that you can just block off each exit with a dome on one, on one end, of course, let the light in. That's, that's actually pretty intuitive. Um, so a nice idea there. I'm stealing that, um, whoever that was. But um, put a dome over, over your lava tube. If it's sealed, that is, there are no like side tubes or whatever that lead off to the Martian air and therefore would provide an escape for air that you pump in there. Um, you can pump in your own oxygen and pressurize it how you want to. You know, I don't know about um, oxygen use in the human body. So I don't know what pressure you set it to of one atmosphere 
one Earth atmosphere around it, or seven, what's it, 760 Tor, um, to, um, to change the pressure. So maybe you're not using as much oxygen to keep your habitat, um, I guess, uh, you know, properly aerated. Thank you very much. Um, yes, ma'am. What Angela wants to know, what type of instruments or main equipment is used in rovers? Boy, that's going to be a long answer. <laughs> that's a great yeah. <laughs> No, you know, that's really what, what I do with my astronomy class is I ask them the general question, what are five instruments that your rover or your orbiter or whatever robot you send out there without human help, um, what instruments would you want to have on that rover? So you'd want spectrometers because spectrometers take light that bounces off the rocks or whatever. And you, interrogating that light, you can actually figure out what elements are in the rock. Uh, all the rovers have some flavor of spectrometer on them, okay? Um, both Curiosity and Perseverance have an X-ray spectrometer uh, that involves a laser that fires holes in rocks. Now that's just, of all the instruments on either machine, that is the coolest one, the rock burning laser. Is what it does is it shoots a hole in the rock about a tenth of an inch deep, and that allows you to then sample the interior of the rock. It's kind of like the equivalent of a rock hammer without all the jolt. Okay, a rock hammer is not a good idea for a robot because lots lots of uh, jerk and jolting, which uh, will cause the all the motors to fail more quickly. So um, so yeah. Today. So that, that's basically it. You want cameras so that the camera can show you what it would look like if you were standing on Mars. You know, the two, the two um, cameras atop Perseverance and Curiosity both allow you to have that panoramic view or set up panoramas of Mars like the one in our background picture here from Spirit. Um, you want a means to get underneath the soil. If you look at the background image here on the left where it says radiation mitigation, uh, you've got all kinds of iron rust on this planet. You have to find a way to get under the rust to see what the minerals are really like. Okay, the minerals that form along with the oxygen, the rust that you see on the surface. But you're basically looking at oxidized iron in the minerals on Mars. So that tells you if you're looking for iron to build with or to make steel or whatever, you've got ample uh, sources of iron ore out there, out there. That's the good news. Uh, the other thing you want, obviously your rover needs a power source. Now Spirit, Opportunity, and Sojourner all use the sun. Uh, Curiosity and Perseverance, as Tony said yesterday, use the radioactive isotope, um, thermal isotope generator to generate uh, heat, or not heat, power by change the heat differential of one thermocouple that is attached to the radioactive decay and another thermocouple that's attached to Mars, or that is exposed to Mars's air. And that thermal difference is what creates the electrical current in the metal. And that's what powers the rovers. So you gotta have a power source. And obviously, if you send a rover all the way to Mars, you probably want it to be able to talk to you and send data back and you send orders to it. Hey, go over here and do this or whatever. Um, so the, the rover has to be able to communicate pretty faithfully with Earth. And that's actually achieved now. There's what, six orbiters going around Mars right now? And all of them act as satellite re relays. So if the rover is on the far side of Mars relative to Earth, it can't send data back to Earth, but it can give it to the Mars Express, which can then beam back to Earth as it gets on the other side of Mars in what, 10 minutes? So it's 10 minute or so data lag. lag. Uh, you have to have, if you're doing ro rovers, mobility that's dependable. Curiosity almost found out the hard way. You can't just be willy nilly in how you design your wheels. Now, I know they, they went into it a lot, and it's, but they just didn't expect the hardness and the sharpness of the rocks Perseverance would have to go over. So, so yeah. So that's in general the things the rover should have on. on. Oh, thank you. Great answer. Next question from Tissia. Is it suggested to land on completely unexplored areas of Mars so that we have a better scope of under of discovering something new or in places that are suitable according to data maps? 
you want to go with the data. And wherever the data tells you to land, that's where you should land. Um, there is a very good argument for landing where something else has already landed because you know it worked once. Okay. So if you're doing like the very first human habitat to Mars, perhaps it might be wise to play it safe and land somewhere like uh, in Jezero Crater with Perseverance. Because as you saw, there's a lot of places that you could land out there. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot to be said for uh, curiosity and discovering new things. You know, if there's a, a landing site that is a good landing site, it's got everything you need, the glacier's right next door, you got a lava tube you can climb into if you need to, or a cliff you can build your habitat alongside, you know, then go for the new stuff. And, you know, remember what Dave Scott said, be aware of grandeur, you know? Give yourself something pretty to look at when you get out in the morning. Okay, next question. Thank you for that. It's from Mena. How can NASA determine the amount of materials found on Mars or any other planet by just analyzing a picture that shows only a part of the planet and not the whole place? Well, that's fair. Like, you know, NASA creates global mosaics out of smaller images. So when you see the, the iconic global mosaic of Mars uh, from the Viking One orbiter, um, that, was, that was about 4,000 images, I think they stitched together to make one panorama, one global picture. Unfortunately, the way satellites, satellites work right now, most of the imaging is close up. That's where uniformitarianism comes in because uh, the same kind of processes, there's a picture here that, uh, there. Um, you can look at some features from the air and tell what they're made of or made, made or the cause of formation of that material, making the assumption that it was the same process that occurred here on Earth. Okay. So when you see that little inset there where it says geology and that laser, that um, not laser, glacier, it almost looks like a tongue sticking out there. That is a very characteristic glacial feature. And um, that's how they can say that's probably a glacier. Always use the word probably because you know we're we're dealing with another planet. There may be other processes going on that we are not aware of that are causing these formations. But um, Occam's razor suggests that we pick the simple answer first, and we move on from there if that's necessary. Okay, so uh, they they do lots of that, and of course um, the spectrometers that are aboard the Mars orbiters can see things like how thick is that ice that's underneath the sand dune on Mars. Or what is the concentration of the hematite in Meridiani planet? You can actually answer those questions and um, without having to look at the whole planet. You know, because uh, hematite is only found in this little tiny area on Mars, about 10 square miles, um, where opportunity land, right in the middle of it. So it is, um, it, I am also a big picture person. So I appreciate the global mosaic. I like that but I also appreciate the individual details each image gives us of uh, what Mars, you know, what Mars looks like and uh, what its problem, what processes went on to show you the things you're seeing on Mars. All right, there it is, where is it? There it is, okay. Okay, um, great answer. So Henshin would, Henshin would like to know, uh, again, apologies if I mispronounce your name. The pressure on Mars is too low to use a helicopter. I know you're going to have something to say about that. <laughs> but can we use an orbital probe to take photos and investigate? Again, you'll have lots to say about that. Just yeah. like when we captured the Zurong spacecraft a while ago and even saw the dust on the solar panels clearly. And then mm -hmm. he has another question after that, but I'll let you answer that first. Okay. Um, all right. So give me the gist of the question again. I'm sorry, I got lost. A helicopter. He wants to know about using a helicopter and yeah, should yeah. use an orbiter instead. Well, um, when you get off this call, look up a thing called, if you type in the words Ingenuity and Mars and search it, look for the NASA site. Uh, the helicopter on Mars, I think, has completed over 50 flights now. I think it's 52 or 53. It's up there. It's up so there. they have a helicopter on Mars. 
it's small. You know, it's a, the brain of the helicopter is encased in this golden bo box of the size of a softball. <laughs> you know, if you're familiar with softball. Um, and the, the idea here is simply that Mars, yeah, it, it would be easy enough to put a helicopter on Mars. There's actually a mission design being done right now for a larger set of helicopters to fly to Mars and to explore. So aerial surveillance is a, is a happening thing. Perseverance has already made a couple of right and left-hand turns as a result of information given to it by the Ingenuity, Ingenuity helicopter. Well, to be fair, uh, sent back to NASA, NASA then sent different orders to Perseverance to carry out because of the information gleaned from the helicopter. Um, okay, what was the second part of that question? The second part is what kind of geological conditions are suitable for vehicle driving? Which geology may make a Mars rover sink into the ground? Mm. Question. Sand. Good question. Sand is, sand is bad. <laughs> um, sand in the dust that, that, that piles up in the dunes is bad. Um, Curiosity had to avoid it's going to avoid a dune field called Bagnold, I believe. That was pretty big. Had to actually drive all the way around this thing, make a big loop to get back up and like uh, back in, up into Gale, uh, not Gale, Mount Sharp, which is what it's climbing right now. Um, so uh, the terrain that Opportunity ran most of its mission on is ideal for driving. It's basically just gravel, you know, on a flat surface. So it was pretty pretty straightforward. Just you know, kick it and drive and go. Um, there were the occasional crater or you know sand dune that it had to avoid, but um, for most of its mission, it was driving on pretty flat terrain. That that's pretty ideal. Um, so that, that was Meridian Planet, if that's something you want to do. But um, there are lots of other places on Mars where you can drive. It's just slower going because you have to go over cobbles and things like that. And your rover can't do that fast because it's analyzing the data it's receiving from its two sets of cameras. Rovers are kind of cool because they have two sets of cameras, one at the deck where the solar panels are or where the instruments are in Curiosity and um, Perseverance's case. But the, the, um, the upper cameras and the lower cameras will take the same image of the landscape in front of it. 3D process it on board the rover's computer and then decide which way is the safest way to drive. The more obstacles you have, the slower going that's going to be, obviously. So, yeah. So there are definitely preferred terrains to drive on Mars. In general, it can't be too much like the foreground here in our, our background image um, right next to my email address there. So that would not be a good place to try and drive the rover. You have to drive around that pile of rock. And I think they're also working on different types of wheels um, mm -hmm. for that yes. reason. And if the humans have their own human rover to drive, they might be able to make those decisions more quickly um, right. on, on which way to go. Angela would like to know, <laughs> I love this question, have rovers right. found life of, on Mars um, in forms of microorganisms such as bacteria? Oh boy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's all right. Mars is you can think of Mars and the search for life on Mars like a murder mystery. Okay. We have all these different things that point to the fact that Mars is or was alive. At some point, there were some living things on it. That, that's you know, it's not gonna come as a surprise if Perseverance team makes an official announcement like that. Okay. I would not be at all shocked. As a matter of fact, the odds favor it, given all the evidence. The problem is we don't have a body. And in a murder investigation, you can't really go too far without a body, right? Um, you have to prove that, in fact, murder was committed. In this case, you have to prove that there was, in fact, life on Mars. And that proof needs to be undeniable. That's the problem. We're getting all these kind of evidence, things like seasonal methane release in certain places on Mars. That's interesting. That's something you might want to look into as you're picking out your landing site. Just go to a place where they emit methane part of the year, you know. Um, and the 
curious pictures taken of what looked like microbes in a Martian meteorite about 25 years ago um, here on Earth. I mean, President Clinton actually made an evening address to the, the country about that particular rock, saying that there it is, we found life on Mars. Well, if you find it once, you can't then go uh, global with it. You have to have more than one piece of evidence that says the same thing if you're going to be proper scientifically. And in this case, um, there was only that one rock and there's only that one evidence so far. So Perseverance's job is to gather samples from life likely locations on the delta and on the floor of the crater and up into the hills beyond the delta when it, once it gets up there and leave those uh, sample tubes for another rover to pick up deliver to a rocket, which then delivers them back to Mars orbit, which then delivers them to Earth. Okay. Um, and so once the Earthbound labs get a hold of them, I think we're going to have the answer to our question. It was there life on Mars? And that answer is probably yes. Is there still life on Mars? That's a very tantalizing question we don't have a good answer for yet. Okay. Maybe you find that answer. Who knows? There is a lot of circumstantial evidence. That's the bottom line, but no yeah. absolute evidence but Thank circumstantial you. yes yes yep. it's my area of specialty so um i gotcha very interested in that thing and actually um students i linked an article about extant life on mars in the syllabus so you can check that out um uh tissy i would like to know do you think some specific material can replace the one used for the rover to avoid damage and corrosion over time? Mm. All right. Well, Tony Rice yesterday was talking about the Mars Yard at JPL. And the Mars Yard, that's exactly what they do. They take out life-size models. They drive them over terrain. They go out and buy the right kind of rocks at Home Depot or wherever. And then they put them, put them out there in the yard and they drive the rover over. For one thing, see what, what's the limits of what a rover could drive over and be wear and tear on, on the wheels. Perseverance's wheels were completely redesigned after um, Curiosity's wheels, and they don't have things like the JPL and blocked out in Morse code so that every time the wheel rolled, it would write JPL in the soil on Mars. Um, cool trick, but it ends up um, you know, making your wheel weaker, which is not a good thing if you're driving over sharp rocks. Um, so person, you know, curiosity rather, um, has had a lot more hard time with its wheels because of its habitat and they weren't the best design. You know, sometimes you have to find out your design design sucks the hard way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was it was cool to see JP, JPL written in the sand over and over, but not, <laughs> the, best, not the best wheel choice. No. Um, students, do you have any other questions? Um, before we log off for the morning. Um, I just want to reiterate how um, much we appreciate you helping us and all of these videos will be uploaded to YouTube within 24 to 48 hours. Um, so you can watch the replay at your leisure. And let's see, Mena, if you're still here, I have a question for you, if you could unmute yourself. Um, Hi. Okay, Thank you. I'm just... Thank you very much, Dr. Brandt. And um, students, I will see you at 1.30 for Greg Autry, uh, 1.30 Pacific time. And Mena, just hang on. Can you unmute yourself, Mena? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Am I saying your name correctly? Yeah, I'm Mena. Okay, so they are not able to join. So I will put you on another team. I was waiting for your team to join and you're in, where are you located? I'm in Egypt. Egypt, that's what I thought. Okay, I'm trying to find somebody with a similar time zone to you um, to make sure I can put you with a team that you can communicate back and forth with while you're both during the day. What time is it there now? Um, currently it's 8 p.m. and 4 p.m. So it's evening there. Yeah. Okay. All right. I will um, put you on a team 